the first topic we'll discuss uh, will be regarding us china ties recently uh, the chinese president xi jinping and uh, the us president joe biden they had a 2 hour long talk so we'll discuss uh, about that in detail and also we'll discuss uh, the role played by the prevention of uh, sexual harassment at workplace act in reducing sexual harassment at workplaces also we'll discuss in detail about the national uh, scheduled tribe commission uh, okay uh, most of the other topics are very uh, static in nature uh, so yeah you can just uh, directly read them without spending too much of time in trying to understand how they work moving on the first topic that we'll discuss is uh conflict not in anyone's interest according to z this is very hypocritical that it's coming from china but however uh, the us president joe biden spoke with his chinese counterpart xi jinping in a video call as russia's invasion of ukraine continues the call lasted for just under 2 hours as per the white house okay currently whatever we know about this particular meeting it is from the chinese handouts because currently we still don't have any information from the white house regarding how the meeting went or what happened at the meeting uh what was discussed in the meeting was that the con- you know the chinese side said that the country should not come to the point of meeting each other on the battlefield conflict and confrontation are not in anyone's interest while peace and security are what the international community should treasure the most according to mr xi jinping very ironical okay the chinese red out said that mr xi told mr biden that mishandling of the taiwan issue could disrupt bilateral ties we know that recently china has been uh, flying jets into the taiwan airspace and this has been uh, met with a lot of criticism from usa why because usa has passed this act called taiwan relations act under which the usa has held that any occupation of taiwan shall not happen through force rather it should happen through peace okay now this is the second high level bilateral discussion between the two countries this week mr biden's national security advisor mr jake sullivan had in person discussions with the communist party of china's politburo member yang jiechi in rome earlier this was the second meeting after this was the first one and currently what happened was a second meeting While a range of issues was discussed by both the sides Russia's invasion of Ukraine was one of the most important things that was discussed China like India had abstained if you remember India had abstained from voting on the UN resolution which called for the withdrawal of Russian troops also according to US officials Beijing was giving Moscow military assistance okay however this has been denied by Beijing that China has been providing any bit of military assistance has been denied by Beijing Okay what are the issues of contention between USA and China The first and the foremost issue is South China Sea because China treats South China Sea as its own lake Okay China Sea South China Sea as its own lake and China has gone for occupation of the South China Sea it goes for construction of artificial reefs artificial islands it goes for militarization of the south china sea okay you must have heard of uh, islands known as the paracel okay the spratly island etc okay so all these are islands artificial islands which have been created by china in order to occupy the south china sea however it has been opposed by several countries in the region like philippines like vietnam okay uh uh like uh, malaysia okay all these countries are opposing uh chinese occupation of the south china sea because they also believe that they genuinely own that sea i mean they also have freedom of access to that sea the established rule based system is being challenged by china's territorial claims okay the us considers it to be a violation of the established rules based system as china is increasing its maritime activities in the south china sea and the east china sea if you remember china had also violated the verdict given by the permanent court of arbitration which is also at hague 
The permanent court of arbitration had given a verdict in favor of Philippines. However, China has not honored this verdict and still it continues to occupy uh, most of the South China Sea. The US also opposes any further militarization of the region because this militarization goes against a rules-based order. It goes against a rules-based order. It goes against the freedom of navigation. Freedom of navigation. It also goes against overflight and trade in the region. Okay. So, since China is breaking all of this, US is, you know, US is, US is a staunch critic of Chinese actions in the region. Another point of contention between USA and China is Taiwan. Like what we spoke, Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, USA is one of the major arms supplier to Taiwan. Okay. In fact, uh, uh, USA has even supplied Taiwan with F-16s, F-16 jets, okay. And uh, China sees this uh, US-Taiwan relationship as a threat to its one China policy. If you know, uh, you know, Taiwan is considered as an integral part of China, according to China, okay. However, Taiwan became a separate uh, entity once the Communist Party of China took over uh, the mainly, mainland China. If you see the map of China, there's this huge part. This is called as the mainland China, while this small, there is this island over here. This is Taiwan. Okay. In 1949, you know, when the Communist Party took over mainland China, uh, the other party that was there, you know, it fled to Taiwan the conservatives they fled to Taiwan it's called the Kuomintang I believe uh, so they fled to Taiwan and they set up their own rule over here hence Taiwan works as a democracy while the mainland uh, mainland China region it still is under the control of the Communist Party itself okay now uh, similarly the US stance on Hong Kong and its condemnation of the way Chinese administration is dealing with the protesters is a point of contention between the two countries why? Because China believes in the one nation, two systems policy. What are the two systems? You know, autocracy or rule of Communist Party in mainland China, while democracy in Hong Kong. This is the one nation, two systems policy. Okay. Uh, however, US support of uh, the protesters in Hong Kong is, is uh, putting this policy in threat, under threat. And hence, China does not like US stand on Hong Kong. Also, the trade deficit, okay, if you know, the US had a trade deficit of around $350 billion with China. The trade deficit has given rise to trade war between the two countries. The US started imposing tariffs on Chinese imports and retaliatory tariffs by China on US goods strained the relations further. US also labeled China as a currency manipulator. Why? Because reducing the value of the yuan or the renminbi will make Chinese exports more competitive and that is why the Chinese central bank tries to weaken the currency. USA has also banned the use of Huawei equipment. Also USA had uh, not just uh, banned the use of Huawei equipment, USA had also arrested uh, some of the Huawei top executives. Uh, they, ha they have been trying to extradite these top members of a Huawei organization from Canada. If you remember, mm. not just that, uh, USA had also banned some of the Chinese entities from operating in the in the US market, like uh, TikTok, because it is believed that TikTok was taking away important data of users from the US, and hence TikTok was also banned from the US. Also, uh, Chinese firms they face regulatory barriers when they try to uh, raise money from the US stock market. U.S.-China tensions also worsened because of the COVID-19 virus as both the countries tried to blame each other. U.S. has always criticized Chinese dealing of Uyghurs. U.S. imposed sanctions on Chinese officials. Apart from that, uh, North Korea. It is believed that the only reason why North Korea is able to survive the sanctions that the U.S. has imposed is because of the Chinese support. Okay. Now, uh, 
uh, also please remember that there is some sort of a ideological war between china and usa and currently many of the strategic thinkers they believe that the new cold war that the new cold war is going to be fought between china and usa okay okay moving on second topic three spotted deer die at iit madras in suspected case of anthrax the three three deer on iit madras campus died in a suspected case of anthrax now what is anthrax anthrax is a disease caused by bacillus anthracis it is a germ it is caused by this germ it affects animals such as cattle sheep and goats more than people people can get anthrax from contact with infected animals or wool or meat or hides it can cause three forms of diseases in people now these three diseases are based on where the uh, germ manifests or where the germ multiplies it can be in the case of it can be through respiratory anthrax infection okay respiratory respiratory anthrax infection now this red, respiratory infection in humans it initially starts off with cold or flu like symptoms and that is followed by pneumonia and severe respiratory issues okay or it can uh, manifest through gastrointestinal infection gastro intestinal infection uh now this gastrointestinal infection which is nothing but stomach based infection this is caused by consuming anthrax anthrax infected meat and it is characterized by uh vomiting of blood severe diarrhea acute inflammation of the intestinal tract and loss of appetite okay now the third place where anthrax can manifest is uh on the skin okay and this is called as cutaneous anthrax okay respiratory anthrax gastrointestinal anthrax and then cutaneous anthrax okay now you get skin lesions and you get boils on the skin when uh, cutaneous anthrax uh, attacks you okay now anthrax does not spread directly from one infected animal to another rather it is spread only through pores if these pores fly and they uh, enter in your body or if they uh, fall on your skin then anthrax can spread to you these pores can be transported by clothing or shoes anthrax has been used in biological warfare by agents and by terrorists to intentionally infect people even in the us it was spread through mail earlier okay exposure to anthrax occupational exposure to infected animals or their products is the usual pathway of exposure for humans okay in the case of animals okay people who are working on dead animals they are exposed to anthrax virus or anthrax germ i'm sorry pretty often and those people are at the highest risk it does not usually spread from an infected human to a non infected human directly okay rather it needs uh animals or animal products in order to spread okay uh either through contact with infected animals wool meat or hides okay so spreading from human to human is very rare but if the disease is fatal to the person's body its mass of anthrax bacilli becomes a potential source of infection to others in case the person is fa- has died because of anthrax then his body can become a source of infection for the others anthrax can also be contracted in laboratory accidents by handling infected animals or their wools or hides okay now in order to cure anthrax you have a 60 day course of antibiotic there is nothing to prevent anthrax rather in order to cure anthrax once his once it has affected you then you can do that treatment is most effective when the cure is started as soon as possible so yeah that is how it is done next prevention of sexual harassment at workplace 
Okay, please remember that this prevention of sexual harassment, it started off after the Supreme Court had given the Vishakha guidelines. The Supreme Court had given the Vishakha guidelines and on the basis of this Vishakha guidelines, the government was forced to enact the Prevention of uh, Sexual Harassment at Workplace Act. Now, moving on. Okay, now, the reason why it is in the news is because the Kerala High Court has asked organizations in the film industry to take steps to constitute a joint committee to deal with sexual harassment of women in workplace. Now, what is the act? What are the provisions of the act? First thing it does is it defines sexual harassment. Sexual harassment includes any one or more of the following, either unwelcome acts or behavior committed directly or through implication, now physical contact and advances, sexually colored remarks, showing pornography, a demand or request for sexual favors, or any other unwelcome physical, verbal or non-verbal conduct of sexual nature. Okay, any of these things can be construed as a sexual harassment. This act lays down the procedures for a complaint and inquiry and action to be taken. Okay, now it mandates that every employer should constitute an internal complaints committee at each office or branch with 10 or more employees. A woman can be of any age, whether employed or not, who alleges to have been subjected to any act of sexual harassment. That means the rights of all the women working or visiting any workplace in any capacity are protected. Please remember this. It's not just for the women who are working at that workplace, but it is also for those women who are visiting that workplace and who are subjected to sexual harassment. Even they can file a case under this act. Now, under this, every employer is mandated to constitute an internal complaints committee. And this internal complaints committee looks into complaints of which are based on sexual harassment. Also, it, it is to be remembered that the complaints committee will have this uh, internal complaints committee is there, no? This internal complaints committee, it will have the powers of a civil court. Now, what can a civil court do? It can uh, gather evidence, it can call people and it can seek evidence, it can uh, get evidence from other uh, government organizations in sealed uh, envelopes. Okay, it can get records, all of that. Also, the internal complaints committee committees are required to provide for conciliation before initiating an inquiry if requested by the complainant. If the complainant itself, if uh, herself, she requires that, you know, I would like if they require that they there should be some sort of a conciliation conciliation then this uh, internal complaints committee should actually try for that conciliation rather than starting of the inquiry itself directly also penalties have been prescribed for employers and non compliance with provisions of the act shall be punishable with a fine and repeated violations may lead to cancellation of the business itself okay so, in case the employers do not uh, constitute an internal complaints committee, okay, they can be fined. And uh, repeated violations can also lead to cancellation of license for practicing. Also, the state government will notify the district officer in every district who will constitute a local complaints committee. Okay, this local complaints committee, what it will do is that it will take care of cases pertaining to women in the unorganized sector okay in the organized sector you have internal complaints committee in case of offices which have more than 10 employees but in the case of uh, unorganized sectors you have this local complaints committee uh, to which people from unorganized sector can go and file their cases of sexual harassment at workplace now what is the problem with the act Okay, the act has entrusted the powers of a civil court to the internal complaints committee without specifying if the members need to have any legal background. Okay, instead of this, if at all, uh, you know, the act had said that 
there is no specific proce there is no specific procedure that has to be followed and it can follow natural justice that would have been better because people on this internal complaints committee they are not people who had essentially read law and and hence it will be difficult to conduct the internal complaints committee in the manner of a civil court also the 2013 act only imposed a fine of 50000 rupees on employers for non compliance with respect to the constitution of the icc this proved to be insufficient in ensuring that employers constituted the icc in a time bound manner if you remember i told you that there is a fine in case that employers don't constitute the internal complaints committee now this fine is actually rupees 50000 rupees however isn't that a little too lenient what if the employer does not constitute any internal complaints committee and keeps paying a fine for a particular period of time uh, it doesn't uh, serve the purpose moving on mere hal mere policy mere hath campaign now this particular campaign has been launched in order to uh, increase the awareness surrounding pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana okay no it was launched recently in karnataka the campaign is a part of the pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana it is aimed at motivating all farmers in the country to insure their crops under the program every farmer who has taken an insurance under the pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana will get policy documents at their doorstep itself okay now what is the pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana it provides a comprehensive insurance cover against failure of the crop thus helping in stabilizing the income of the farmers all food and oil seed crops and annual commercial horticultural crops for which past uh, yield data is available are covered under the pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana all food and oil seeds crops and annual commercial and horticultural crops for which the past yield data okay the data from previous years is available okay the prescribed premium is nothing but 2% which is to be paid by the farmers for kharif crops and 1.5% for rabi crops okay under kharif you majorly get paddy it pulses okay cotton and so on and under rabi you get mustard you get wheat you get barley okay moving on in the case of annual commercial and horticultural crops the premium is 5% it's higher for the horticultural crops okay because even the gains are higher now only this much has to be paid by the farmer premium cost over and above the farmer share was equally subsidized by the states and the government of india okay now how much ever the premium cost is okay the rest premium cost how much ever higher it is earlier it was equally subsidized by the states and the government of india however in the case of special category states like uttarakhand or in the case of himachal pradesh then uh, the central government will subsidize 90% while the states pay only for about 10% in most of the other states it's 50 50 center pay 50% while the states also pay the rest 50% the scheme was compulsory for loney farmers availing crop loan kisan credit card okay for notified crops and voluntary for the others so all those farmers who are taking a loan for them the pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana was compulsory while for the others it wasn't compulsory now the scheme has been revamped in the year 2019 and the latest uh, provisions are in order to ensure more efficient and effective implementation of the scheme the central government had revamped it and now it has been made completely voluntary enrollment is 100% voluntary for all farmers from 2020 kharif and limit to central subsidy the cabinet has decided to cap that the center's premium subsidy under the scheme for premium rates is only 30% for unirrigated crops and areas and 25% for irrigated areas please remember this and the rest of the money has to be managed by the states itself okay earlier earlier uh, most of the money i mean even if the premium that had to be paid by the government was around 90% then the government would pay but currently the the center with the revamped uh, pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana 2.0 the center has announced saying that only 30% of the uh, 
uh, I mean, only 30% of the premium will be paid by the center in the case of unirrigated areas and 25% of the premium will be paid in irrigated areas. Okay. Now, more flexibility to the states. The government has given the flexibility to the states to implement the Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bhima Yojana and has given them the option to select any number of additional risk covers and features. Okay. Uh, also, insurance companies have to now spend at least 0.5% of the total premium collected on information, education and communication activities. These are the new features. Okay. Apart from that, also please realize that uh, there will be a great use of technology under the scheme. That is one of the major features of the scheme. Uh, smartphones will be used to capture and upload data of crops which will cut down the delays in payments to farmers okay because of this smartphones can be used and that will reduce the delay in payment of uh, money to the farmers also all sorts of uh, all sorts of Calamities are uh, covered under the scheme, okay, uh, due to, you know, issues such as natural fires, natural fires are covered, lightning, storm, hailstorm, cyclone, typhoon, all of them would be covered, including pests, even they would be covered under the scheme. Hmm. Okay, uh, in for some localized problems, okay, and uh, loss or damage occurring from localized risks such as hailstorm, landslide, and inundation would also be covered. Okay, in case of localized uh, disturbances, even localized issues, not just bigger natural disasters. But also localized issues will also be covered. Also be covered. Now, moving on. Extension Rebellion. What is this Extension Rebellion? It is nothing but a group which is working in order to uh, reduce climate change and protect the earth. World over activists of the Extension Rebellion are staging protests in various formats. Initially, it was launched in the United Kingdom as a response to the report of the IPCC. Now, it is a global movement which seeks to rebel and asks groups to self-organize without the need for anyone's permission to come up with collective action plans as long as they are there to the group's core principles and values. Now, what are the group's core principles and values? They are related to environmental protection. They are related to prevention of climate change. Now, it is a decentralized, it is not centralized or controlled by any one entity. It is a decentralized international and political non-partisan movement using non-violent direct action and civil disobedience to persuade governments to act on climate and ecological emergency. It has three core demands. It wants the governments to tell the truth, to act now and to go beyond politics in order to confront climate and ecological emergency. How is this, uh, you know, how is this extension rebellion? Related to India, the movement claims to have been inspired by 15 major civil disobedience movements. And if you can remember, the Indian Freedom Movement was one of the major civil disobedience movements against the British Empire. Okay. Uh, they are also inspired by Women's Suffrage Movement, Arab Spring and India's struggle for freedom. Okay. There are several uh, groups within India which are fighting for this extension rebellion. Please remember some of the points of it and you can use it in mains and you can use it in your essay answer also. I mean in your essay also. That now it is completely going to a deinstitutionalized sphere. This protests or uh, safeguarding of environment, it is becoming non-partisan and it is becoming decentralized. Okay. And uh, it is becoming more spontaneous. Moving on. Next topic. Original manuscripts from Nalanda to be translated. Okay. 
what was nalanda nalanda was an ancient center of higher learning in ancient india the site of nalanda was located in the indian state of bihar okay very close to patna now we shall read more about it over here steps are being why is it in the news okay steps are being taken to translate and publish hundreds of original buddhist manuscripts from nalanda and vikramshila both of them are great monasteries which are located in and around bihar itself the process has been started by the central institute of higher tibetan studies at sarnath the manuscripts were saved from being burnt in the 12th and 13th centuries by bakhtiyar khilji's army and later brought back to india from tibet by traveler uh, and freedom fighter mr rahul sankirtayan okay if you remember in the 12th and 13th centuries uh, we had the delhi sultanate which was ruling and we had kutubuddin aibak so kutubuddin aibak general was bakhtiyar khalji so bakhtiyar khalji he went to bihar and he destroyed most of the temples and monasteries over there and uh, even though he destroyed these uh, monasteries and universities such as nalanda vikramshila these documents were actually safeguarded they were saved and somehow they were sent to tibet okay and later uh, like what i read over here just now uh, rahul sankirtan who was a freedom fighter he brought these documents back from tibet to uh, bihar itself again the original buddhist manuscripts were saved during the burning of the two great ancient universities of nalanda and vikramshila and taken to tibet the manuscripts were brought back to india by sankirtan and are now housed in the patna museum the manuscripts were written in sanskrit okay now what is the nalanda university it was one of the greatest universities of that uh, era and there was people who used to come from all the way from middle east you know they used to come from china in order to study over here in nalanda kumar gupta of the gupta dynasty founded the nalanda university now this happened around 400 ad and it flourished for uh, 600 years until the 12th century during the era of harsha and the pala monarchs it rose to popularity until the 12th century when the turkish ruler kutubuddin aibak general bakhtiyar khilji demolished the nalanda university The university remained a hub of intellectual activity. It is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Please remember, Government of India passed a resolution to revive the university, and now currently Nalanda University has been re-established at Rajgir. It it taught about all the sects of Buddhism. Please remember this: all sects of Buddhism were taught. However, the major thing that was promoted was the Mahayana Buddhism. Okay, although they were. secular disciplines like grammar logic epistemology and science which were also covered some of the scholars who were very famous from nalanda are nagarjuna and the school that he belonged to was the madhyamika shunyavad school aryabhatta was also from the nalanda during harsha's reign the chinese traveler huan sang he visited the university and he wrote a detailed account about the university ai sing who was he he was one of those uh, persons who traveled to india during the gupta era he stated that nalanda housed more than 2000 students and was supported by money from 200 villages archaeological evidence also indicates that contact with the indonesian shailendra dynasty one of whose kings built a monastery in the complex now vikramshila university The Vikramshila University was not built by the Guptas rather it was built under the Palas much later under Dharmapala Okay Ah uh, Dharmapala was Mr Gopala's son he was the one who founded the Odantapuri University This demonstrates how important education was to Pala rulers Okay around 1203 it was destroyed again by Bakhtiyar Khalji's forces was a center for vajrayana buddhism unlike nalanda which was a center for mahayana buddhism and it employed tantric pre- preceptors logic vedas astronomy urban development law grammar philosophical philosophy and other disciplines were also taught thus most of the education was also secular there was nothing extremely religious about the education it was also secular vikramshila university two students from all over the country as well as other countries and one of the most important students was atiya dipankara 
who was the founder of the Tibetan Buddhist Chakra tradition. So please remember who studied where. Uh, these guys are these people are very famous. Also, moving on, the National Scheduled Tribes Commission is dysfunctional, according to a parliamentary panel. The National Commission for Scheduled Tribes has been dysfunctional for four years and has not delivered a single report to the parliament. Uh, according to the parliamentary panel okay the reports that are pending they include a study of the impact of the polavaram dam in andhra pradesh on the tribal population and also they have not submitted any report on the rehabilitation and resettlement of tribal people displaced by the rurkela steel plant till now now what is this national scheduled tribes commission okay this was not there at the time of writing of the constitution came into being much later it was set up with effect from uh, february 19 2004 by amending article 338 by inserting 338a this article stands for national commission for scheduled tribes uh, through the 89th constitutional amendment act hence it is a constitutional body it comprises of a chairman a vice chairman three other members who are appointed by the president by warrant under his hand and seal at least one member should definitely be a woman okay please remember this okay and then the chairperson and vice chairperson and other members they hold a term for three years members are not eligible for reappointment for more than two terms also please remember that you know while the chairman shall be appointed from amongst eminent social and political workers who are belonging to scheduled tribes and uh, who inspire other uh, scheduled tribes to achieve better things okay the chairman again i am repeating he shall be appointed from amongst eminent social and political workers belonging to scheduled tribes itself he shall be a scheduled tribe person and he should be able to inspire other people to do bigger tasks also the vice chairperson and other members must also be definitely chosen from uh okay from the scheduled tribes itself i'm sorry the vice chairperson and the all the other members out of which at least two shall be appointed from amongst the persons belonging to the scheduled tribes okay now moving on while the chairman has the rank of a cabinet minister the vice chairperson has the rank of a minister of state mos while the other members have ranks of secretary of the union government okay and most of them shall belong to sts itself including the chairman and uh, the vice chairperson and the members what are the powers of the commission it should be able to investigate and monitor all matters relating to safeguards provided to the scheduled tribes under the constitution or under any law okay like prevention of atrocities against scheduled uh, castes and scheduled tribes okay now uh, for the time being in force or under any order of the government they should safeguard all of this they need to enquire into specific complaints with respect to the deprivation of rights and safeguards of sts and for this they also have the powers of a civil court okay they can enforce the appearance of any witness they can get any record okay uh, they can participate and advise in the planning process of socio economic development of sts and to evaluate the progress of their development to present to the president annually and as such other times uh, when the commission may deem fit reports upon the working of the safeguards these safeguards which are provided for sts under the constitution or in or under any other statute okay to make in such a report that they present to the president recommendations as to other measures that should be taken by the union or states for effective implementation of the safeguards and they should also be able to discharge other functions in relation to protection welfare and development and advancement of the scheduled tribes as the president may specify it depends on what the president is giving to the ncst 
No. Moving on. Uh, like what I said, they can summon and enforce the atten attendance of any person and examine on oath any person, uh, NCST, because they have the powers of a civil court. And uh, they can also ensure the production of any document that they need. Okay. Moving on. Suspected poisoning kills 100 vultures. At least 100 vultures, all of them are Himalayan griffins, died of suspected poisoning in Assam. When they eat uh, poisoned carcasses, these vultures end up dying. Our 12 vultures and a steppy eagle, which is also a scavenger, were saved. A study by the Bombay National History Society and other organizations in the 1990s found that, you know, of the gyps group. A gyps group is a population of vultures. Around, uh, and it comprises of the Himalayan griffin, the white rumped uh, vulture, the slender build vulture, okay, their population had declined by around 40 million or by 99% in just two decades. Now, what are the Himalayan griffins? It is one of the two largest old world vultures and it is a raptor. Raptors are, you know, birds which are birds of prey. International Union for Conservation of Nature status is that it is near threatened and it is found along the Himalayas and adjoining the Tibetan plateau. Himalayan vultures are also susceptible to toxicity induced by diclofenac. See, diclofenac is one of the drugs which uh, veterinary doctors use in order to treat animals such as cows. Okay, And uh, diclofenac's residues in domestic animal carcasses affects the kidneys of these vultures. Once the kidneys fail, these vultures automatically, they die. And that is a big problem. Uncontrolled veterinary usage of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, including acyclofenac, ketoprofen and nimesulide are toxic to vultures if they feed on the carcasses within 72 hours of death of the carcass. What are white rumped vultures? This species qualifies as critically endangered because it has suffered an extremely rapid population decline of greater than 99% over the three generations. Primarily as a result of diclofenac again. See, this is one of the criterions for animals to be declared as critically endangered. That there has been a population decline of more than 99% in the last three generations. White rumped vultures are found in Pakistan. India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar. So they are not just found only in India. They are found in several other countries. Please remember that white rumped vulture is a critically endangered species. While the Himalayan griffon is just a near threatened species. It occurs mostly in plains and less frequently in hilly areas. Where it utilizes light woodland, villages, cities and open areas. Okay, this bird is actually social and it is found in in flocks. A flock comprises of a number of birds. Okay, so uh, the vulture or the white rumped vultures appear in flocks. Also, one more thing that you have to know is you have to read about the uh, Jatayu Vulture Conservation Center in Pinjor. in Pinjor, okay. Because of the rapid decline of vultures, the government had to step in and they had to take up a conservation uh, measure. This is known as the Jatayu Vulture Conservation Center. And over here, uh, vultures are nurtured in captive. And then once they are big enough, they are let out into the wild. Okay, thank you.